Hello and welcome back to Elliot Designs. Today we'll be looking at part two of my series on linear phase EQ and room correction. Today we'll be looking at rephase and we'll start off with how to install it. So if you look in the description of my video you'll see a link to rephase. If you click on that you'll see under the download section there is a button saying latest version. That is what you'll click on to download it. Once downloaded you'll see it's a compressed file as seen here. You'll left click it, right click it, hit extract all, show extracted files when complete and there you are. That is the installation process. Something called a portable installation so you won't see it in your start menu or anything. You'll need to revisit this folder and open the application as such every time you want to use it. Now that we're in the application you'll want to know some of the basics. Here is our graph. On the bottom we have our usual logarithmic scale frequency. On the left side we have our gain in decibels starting at 10 going all the way down to minus 70 mostly because you want all of your frequencies to be cut not gains. On the right side you have the axis for phase measuring from 180 degrees to minus 180 degrees. If you want to know about that please visit my video on linear phase. There should be a link popping up on screen now. Now let's get started. First thing you want to do is head over to the paragraphic gain EQ settings right here. Under tools by clicking the drop down arrow you'll see import rew filter settings and you'll select your xml file that you generated using rew as shown in part one and open it. Rephase then applies this file and you're able to see it on the graph above. It automates to minimum phase as you can see by this light blue dotted line and you can read that phase on the right hand side. The dark blue line is represented by gain on the left but we can change that right here by clicking from minimum phase to linear phase and that is now perfectly flat just as we want it. Down below is our slider selection. These are all of the filters that we have imported from Room EQ Wizard. If you wanted to you could go into the separate banks and add as many more filters as you would like. Just know that you have to change from minimum phase to linear phase for each one of these. Now back to our room correction. In the impulse settings you have the number of taps. The more taps the more processing power but also the more detailed response you can get particularly into low frequencies. Let's demonstrate that. If I put in a quite a low number of taps, let's say 200, and generate the impulse, you can see that we don't get much information at all in the low frequencies. That's because it's only represented by 2.268 milliseconds of impulse. Essentially, okay, yes, it's all linear, but because of the short time frame, we don't get any information in the low frequencies. There are two things we can do about that. One, is we can ignore the noise floor below let's say 100 decibels. That's okay because we're not going to hear anything below 100 decibels anyway and instead it uses all of that data below that noise floor and reuses it and repurposes it for our bass response or effectively giving you more taps for the same processing power. Here it didn't manage to change much because we don't have many taps in the first place so let's increase it a bit. Let's say something a little more reasonable, about 2000 taps, probably something around about that the Mini DSP HD is capable of. Hit that, no optimization enabled. Okay, yes, we have some aspect of the base frequency being corrected here, but none of the detailed response. So we go into optimization. Moderate is usually enough optimization for most of your needs, but you can always try the higher values. And as you can see, it's deepened some of the edges as much as it can. Let's step it up a bit. 4,000 taps. No optimization. A little more detailed still. Turn on the optimization. And it's starting to do a bit more. Deepening these lines and getting them closer to the ideal response in blue. Now let's go up to the number of taps I'd usually use. Typically in the 10,000 or above range, depending on what I'm using. For room equalization such as this, 10,000 typically seems to be enough with optimization. Let's see how that works. Pretty close. That is looking at this graph about a decibel of change and that's just filled in to even less. Pretty perfect for what we want. Now we have more important things to consider than that, such as our rate. This means our sampling rate. 
What sampling rate is our player going to be using? The most common sampling rates used are 44.1 kHz, which is its default, and 48 kHz. For some players, you might find that you have higher sampling rates, such as 96 and 192 kHz. As you go up in sampling rate, for example, up to 192 kHz, the amount of samples represent less time. So in 44.1 kHz, it represented 113 milliseconds. With that 113 milliseconds, we were able to get quite a lot of detail in the base. But 192 kHz, let's see how much detail in the base we can get now. Not much, even with the optimization. And this is why. We only have 26 milliseconds, and that's because the sampling rate is much higher. So for higher sampling rates, you need to increase the taps, and have more processing power in order to do that. For example, let's try 20,000 taps. And as you can see, after doubling the amount of taps, we are still nowhere near where we were with 44.1 kHz. But that's okay if you have enough processing power, it's just something worth keeping in mind. Because the sampling rate in here, you do want to match what your player will be using, because otherwise you'll get some really strange artifacts that you don't want. This can be helped by upsampling, or downsampling your audio using a converter built into your player. There are a couple of other options that exist here. These do not matter. We have windowing, which we can leave default, as well as centering. FFT length, that automatically changes depending on the amount of taps that you put in, so we also don't need to worry about that. Format is something that we do need to worry about. Format is essentially the file that it will output for our impulse. Essentially, you'll want to choose the one that works with your player, or source of DSP. Typically, these are in .txt format or WAV files. Your DSP or playback typically will say what file format it supports. The ones I'll be going over in future videos though, I'll tell you exactly which formats you'll need for those methods. Your output will pretty much be the same for most of them, but do know that the lower amount of bits, such as 16 or 24 bits, contain less information especially dynamic range information, i.e. the range of decibels that it will represent. The other thing is your directory. Typically, it will default to where your rephase file is, so we don't really need to worry about that. File name, self-explanatory, you can use hyphens and underscores, capitalization, and most other symbols. If you use a symbol that it doesn't support, it will tell you, so there's no need to worry about that. Other things are, you've got your frequency ranges for your graph, your amplitude ranges for your graph, as well as your phase ranges. Hide result phase below 100 decibels. Essentially what this means is if you want to see any phase that's happening below your noise floor or below a given amount of dB, you'll want to change these values to represent that. Here, if I click on minus infinity, it's hiding no phase. So essentially any phase that's represented by this blue line all the way down to infinity would be shown. And here we can see there is exactly linear phase all the way down to zero decibels. That's not necessarily important, but it's worth keeping in mind in case you want to check it, because it won't always be linear, especially when using optimization. That is pretty much everything you'll need to know in order to get an FIR or impulse file for your applications of DSP or convolution. And so I'll leave part two there with you. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, please leave a like and subscribe. In part three of this series, I'll be showing you a program that you can use on your Windows computer to apply this file to any audio outputs you may have. Hope you found it useful and see you soon.